Well, good morning. You are so welcome here. All of you got an extra hour of sleep, I think even more than the rest of the services. Uh, so good to have you guys. Um, will you give, uh, help me give a hand to Sam and Natasha? They're on the stage for the first time today. Uh, today, we want to introduce a new song to you that we're going to sing. And um, I really love it because we have so many songs that's about us and how much, you know, what God can do for us and how great it is to know Him. But this song is just all about Him, all about who He is. Um, if you memorize this song, you'll probably know every single name that God has called in the Bible, all of the things that He does, what He means to us. And I think that's pretty cool. And it's a lot of words, but there will be two lines that we're gonna be repeating a lot in this song that's really easy that you can sing or shout with us and declare with us. One is, how great is your name? How great is His name, amen? And the second one is Yahweh, we love you. Yahweh is the Hebrew name for God, meaning I am, because He was and He is and He is to come. He's the Alpha and He's the Omega, He is everything. And so I wanna encourage you as New Hope, as a congregation, that we're gonna shout and we're gonna sing over and over, Yahweh, we love you, because we do, amen? <laughs> as His kids, as His church, as the bride, as the body of Christ, we wanna to declare to our King that we love Him. So will you do that with us right now? Stand with us. We're gonna sing and rock out a little.
Within our lungs, a new sound is stirring. It sounds like, how great is your name? Come on, we're gonna declare this church. We sing, how great is your name? Come on, say to your king right now, how great is your name? Oh, name above all names, we sing, how great is your name? worship him.
Lord, we want to worship you because you're so worthy. Thank you for taking our broken hearts and making it whole again. Sing with me. Hold me now in the hands that created the heavens. Find me now where the grace runs as deep as your scars. You pull sign of surrender hold my heart now and forever my soul cries out here I stand here I stand I am surrender I need you now hold my heart now and forever my soul
Thank you, God, that we can say, that we can see in these baptism testimonies how you've loved us, how your grace have held us, even in times when we were far away from you. Thank you that you are with us that you desire to have a relationship with us, that you are not some God that is far away, that is inaccessible to us, but that we may enter your presence, that we may enter in a relationship with you. I pray that every person in this place will encounter and experience you and know that you are real, Lord. I thank you, God, for your word. That's a lamp onto our feet that shows us how to live, that tells us who you are. And I thank you for Pastor Nathan that's gonna share this message with us that is the truth. I pray that we'll get ready to listen, receive, and apply it to our lives, Lord, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Yeah, thank you so much, worship team, tech team, camera team. Thank you for joining us today. Uh, what an awesome Sunday, three more baptisms today, so absolutely, we should be excited about that. We get to also continue our series in uh, Finding Freedom in Christ, but today I want to specifically look at the ways that we, you and I, Christ followers, choose or let ourselves be deceived. We, the way we stay in bondage. And actually, maybe you didn't know this, we often choose to remain in bondage. This comes from Galatians chapter 5. It said, it is for freedom, your freedom, that Christ died to set you free. So, Christian, stand firm. Stand on the rock of Christ. Build your life, your house, your family, your hope on the rock of Jesus. And do not let yourself, do not let yourself be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. That means don't go back to your old ways before you were made new in Christ. Don't be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. And yet, if we're honest, we do. So I have good news today. If you are at all like me and you're faulty pursuit of freedom in Christ, we get grace and we get to continue to try to remove the bondage in our lives. This is spoken about in Hebrews. Maybe you know the text. It says, let us throw off the sin that so easily entangles us and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. That means that we can choose to throw off the sin. I love how Curtis said it in his baptism testimony last week. Maybe you heard it, he said that the lie of suicide followed him around and stalked him after witnessing what he did. And then he remembered the ancient truth that there is power in the name of Jesus. And he told that lie of suicide to leave him alone in Jesus' name, and it did. And it did. So I hope you get encouraged this morning, because there's good news that you can indeed find freedom in Christ. It's why Christians are eternal optimists. We don't live in perpetual fear. We live in perpetual hope. Hope in a savior, hope in a creator, hope in one that who is for us and who is with us. So whether you're a Christian or not here today, I think we can all pretty well agree that there is evil in our world. Often it's out there and too often it's in here, isn't it? Well, John 10.10 10 says there is an evil one. There's one that's deceiving us. It says the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. I have come that you may have life and have it to the full. And so today we want to take a moment to look at how the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. How he does that first and foremost to our physical bodies, which isn't often maybe the main topic of conversation, but is biblical. And then how he does that to our relationships, one to another. And then lastly, how he does that to our relationship with God and how we let ourselves be deceived. So let's start with our physical bodies. We love to say, especially in Christian circles, all sins are equal, but the Bible continues to elevate and make an exception of sexual sin. Sexual sin. Almost every single book in the Bible renounces specifically sexual immorality. Why? Why is there such an elevated call on the use and the care of our physical bodies. This is certainly countercultural in our world today. The physical body is seen as a means to an end, you know, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. We're seen even in Christian circles, we go, well, one day we'll get a new body in the new earth, so who cares really? Well, the Bible places a pretty big emphasis on our physical bodies, our God's creation that he loves. 
In 1 Corinthians 6, 18, it says, flee, run away, run away from sexual immorality. Don't flirt with it. Don't skate close to the line. If it's there, turn your back and sprint in the other direction. Flee from it. All other sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. And then in verse 19, it says, do you not know that your bodies are temples of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you received from God? You are not your own. You were bought with a price, the shed blood of Jesus on the cross. Therefore, honor God with your bodies. Now, your bodies aren't a temple because you have rock-hard abs. Good for you if you do. Our bodies are temples because they are filled with the Holy Spirit. When we accept Christ into our lives, he indwells in us. And therefore, when we engage in abuse of the physical body and sexual immorality, we invite the Holy Spirit into that as well. There's a great lie that somehow you could sin in secret, but that is just not possible. You invite the Holy Spirit into the abuse of your body. And when we act in ways that our bodies or our minds were just never created to or never intended to, we corrupt the whole body. That means mentally, physically, and as I said with the Holy Spirit, spiritually. This text is also saying the your here is plural. It's referring to us as the church, the temple. The church is made up of many bodies. Welcome. However, if I defile my body, it's not just a secret sin that matters to me. It defiles the whole body, my wife, my kids, and our church. This is the call to care for our physical bodies. And sexual immorality is probably one of the main lies that is propagandized, if that's a word, in our world today. We're, we hear it that there's really no negative consequences. In fact, the lie that we often believe is that everyone does it, it's okay. A movie, social media, TikTok, or Instagram, they can convince us that this is just kind of normal. But none of those things should contrast or take precedent over what the Bible says. The Bible gives us clear instructions on intimacy in a marriage. And anything outside of that starts to rewire our brains into objectifying one another. There's a great book called Wired for Intimacy. In this book, it does some scientific research on neuropathways to try to help us understand that the more we give ourselves to sexual immorality in our thought life, in our experiences, in our actions, in what we watch and consume, the more these neuropathways form grooves in our brain and we keep wanting to feed them and feed them and feed them and they never fully satisfy us. And it's actually... If you look up any history, what's led to horrific actions in individuals throughout history. And these same neural pathways happen for us as we continue to consume and feed these never-ending vacuum of sexual sin. But as I started today, there's good news. God does and is redeeming and renewing our minds. He's actually created our minds, our brains, to be plastic, to be malleable. And the same book says that if 90 days of abstaining from these desires, we create brand new neural pathways, meaning that within only 90 days, he starts to renew our minds to see one another as objects that God loves and not objects for our satisfaction. God can and will renew your mind if you allow him, and you can, and many have, experienced freedom in that. But this is only one of the ways that we remain in bondage and shackles to our sin. We abuse our bodies in other ways as well. These ways that I'm about to speak of are actually gonna, you're going to hear in the testimonies today as well. In moments of feeling hopeless or helpless, we look for some form of control. How to find a way to cope with the pain. And many have turned to self-harm in those moments. Now this may be a level of bondage that is hard for you to even understand or comprehend but it is a stronghold the enemy loves to have. What could be a better picture of him trying to kill, steal, and destroy than us harming the physical body that God created and loves? And self-harm takes effect in other ways too, from an eating, like eating disorders. 
in an effort to gain some semblance of control, maybe over our appearance, maybe just li- our lives are chaotic and we seek control and we start to battle with these lies. Curtis mentioned, as I already alluded to, the lie of suicide that was last week. This lie is not just that your body is worthless, it's worse than that. The lie says your body is worthless and you are a burden. My friends, if you've heard or experienced any one of these lies, they are from the pit of hell. It is not true. You are so much more valuable than you possibly know. And the enemy would love to keep you in bondage and keep you stunted and keep you hopeless and keep you in despair instead of allowing you to thrive in Christ, to thrive in the missional kingdom call that he has for you. Don't journey these lies alone. Invite your friends, your family, your church into it. We would be honored to pray with you and weep with you and journey it with you so you can too find freedom. We abuse our bodies with substances like alcohol, smoking, drugs, or food, all just to cope with life's many, there are many, difficult problems. It's an abuse of our God-given body and it's allowing us to remain in bondage. Instead of deepening our trust in God or, or deepening our reliance in a good, faithful God who's with us, we hold on to these strongholds as a way to survive. Maybe you've struggled with some of those. Maybe none of these have been a struggle for you. I just want to say, well done. That's awesome for you. But could you be the church? Because the people sitting next to you are struggling with this. How are you being a part of the solution in our world and in our church family? You don't have to, the mission is out there. Sure, it's, they're showing up here and they need you. They need you to give them hope. They need you to point them back to Jesus and help them find freedom. Will you participate? We allow our physical bodies to get abused. We also allow our relationships to be divided. Diablo, the word Diablo in Greek means division or to throw us apart, to scatter us, to divide us. That's where the word divorce comes from. And the enemy's pretty good at this. Throughout history, he's been dividing marriages and families and friends in the church. And marriage, in particular, is such a sacred commitment and covenant, and the enemy doesn't like it. We're told that, the, that marriage is actually supposed to be a picture of Christ in the church. It's from Ephesians 5. Therefore, as men, godly men in marriages, we're called to lay our lives down for our wives. We're called in 1 Peter to, to be careful and considerate with our wives. We're called in scripture as husband and wife to be one flesh, so intimately united, so intimately one flesh that we are united like how we are united with Christ. We are called in scripture to a much more high, lofty, holy call in marriage than ever before. Our world tells us that marriage, like most relationships, are transactional. If you're good to me, I'm good to you. The day you're not good to me, well, I'm no longer good to you. But that isn't what the Bible says at all. Scripture speaks of mutual submission, of one submitting to the other over and over again. And it's a much more beautiful picture of Christ and his church. As you learn to submit to one another with their flaws, with their failures, you get to learn the gospel you get to experience the love of Jesus. Because isn't this his love for us, his church, the bridegroom? He's the one that's long-suffering. He's patient with us. Are we happy about that? He's patient with us. He's forgiving us. We're gonna take communion together. and Remember, he's the one that continually forgives us. And we get to live that out in our relationships and in our marriages. Well, the enemy doesn't just work against families, though he's working against yours, and you ought to fight for your marriage and family. The enemy's been great at destroying friendships and extended families as well, and other relationships. I mean, in our world today, there's no real secret. We, we divide pretty easily and pretty quickly. It doesn't take much. Politics, yep, division. Work, finances, inheritance, division. Even sports, we divide over. So if you're a Miami Dolphins fan, you can leave the back door. The ushers will see you out. Amen. Bills are on in 45 minutes. No, we don't divide over that. 
Seriously, though, there's relationships that matter, and we divide way too quickly. Way too quickly. God calls us to a deep brotherly intimacy. In 1 Thessalonians 4, we're called to be known and loved. And these relationships, we quickly divide over because they get hard. They get hard. We're fully known. They know our flaws, our failures, our wins, our losses. They know how to push our buttons. And so when things get hard, it becomes too difficult. And we run. We divide. We don't see eye to eye. Well, then we can't be in relationship with one another. But that is not what the scriptures teach. In fact, there's some really beautiful examples of friendship in the scripture. Paul and Timothy, Ruth and Naomi, Elijah and Elisha. You should look those up as you try to be a friend to others. And our families do this too. Our families divide very quickly. Jesus mentioned this in Matthew 12, mentioned this idea of a family united or divided. He was talking to the crowd and his brother and his mother's were, mother, was, mother's mother was outside. And someone said, hey, uh, they want to speak with you. And he replied to them, who is my mother and who are my brothers? And then he points to his disciples. He said, here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my father in heaven is my brother and sister and mother. Friendships and families divide very easily because they are not built on the solid rock of Jesus. If you build your relationships, friendships, or your family and your household on something fleeting and fickle, then it will divide easily. But if we are built on the missional call of Christ in our lives, then we will stay united on something way bigger than me, way bigger than you, something kingdom bound. And this is why we call it a church family. Maybe you've heard that church is a little bit new to you and you hear people calling brother and sister. You think it's weird cultish, incestual thing. The Bible says that we're a family. We're born again, baptized like these guys are, into the body of Christ, into the family. And so this is a sacred relationship that we fight for unity in because we now share a bloodline and it's the blood of Jesus shed for us. Our DNA is indeed changed. We are changed into followers of Jesus and therefore we are united. There's some ways that we divide very quickly and here's a few of them. I'm sure there's many more. We slander and we gossip. And unfortunately, the church is certainly not immune to this. Now, I will give a quick distinction here. If you want to gather some of your friends and get together this week and talk about Pastor Nathan, I'd like to encourage you to do so. If you'd like to talk about how you can love me and care for me, the areas that you're concerned for me, that as you pray, maybe the Holy Spirit will speak to, as you care for our leadership and the people around us, if you want to spend time figuring out how to make meals for me because you know I can't cook, all these things, you should take out your phone and schedule that with your friends right now. That's not gossip, right? Is that the church trying to be the church to help somebody? That's what the church does. But you know when it turns to gossip. It's when it no longer matters. We're not actually going to come and help Pastor Nathan. We just want to talk about all the things we don't like about him. The issues we have with him. There's no way we're coming alongside him to care for him. We just are upset about these things and want to air some grievances with our friends and family. You know these moments that turn to gossip because it's not about us helping and being the church anymore. And it's more about voicing our displeasure with one another. Can I encourage you, because you will be invited into gossip again, probably soon, maybe in the tent after service. When someone invites you into gossip, don't go, gossiper, and then flee, you know, run, sprint away from them. Try to encourage and redirect the conversation. Oh, they're mismanaging their money. I didn't know that. They're spending on what? Oh my word. How are we going to help them? Did you want to book a meeting with them and we could all come alongside them to hear the truth and maybe figure out how we can care for them? Redirect the conversation to being the hands and feet of Jesus. We can do that as mature believers because even gossip is often misdirected love that turns into a selfish desire. Well, gossip, slander, for sure that's one that happens, but another one that is all too often within the Christian community is fighting. We're called to fight. We're called to fight for the lost sons and daughters to wage war on evil in our world. We're called to bring hope and bring light to a dark world. We're called to pray for our faith five, that the names that we write down to intercede on their behalf, 
to trust God in the spirit, heavenly realm to win their soul for the kingdom. We fight. That's a call on us, and yet we turn inwards way too quickly. This is why church, in church circles, people often get angry and fight about the craziest things. I, Nathan, once ran a tablecloth ministry. I had my bin of tablecloths. It said, Nathan's tablecloths don't touch. And someone touched my tablecloths. <laughs> they took them, and they used them for their stupid youth night. Jeez. And then they didn't return them washed, and I had to wash them. And so I told the lead pastor on them and said, they're not ever touching my tablecloths again. That Guys, that's, this is actual, not a true story, thank goodness. Probably at some other church, not here. Guys, this is what happens within the body of Christ. The enemy is so good at quickly turning our fight inwards. And it's why if you've been a part of church circles forever, you're shocked about the things people get upset about. The gravel in the grass or this happened. You're like, how, is, how are we fighting about this? There's an actual war going on, guys. And the enemy has got us super distracted and he's pretty happy about it. Because the longer he can have you upset with me about tablecloths, the less we can do for the kingdom. And we ought to be more sober-minded about the things that we hold on to and take offense about. Lastly, it's how the enemy gains a stronghold in our relationship with God. P.T. said last week that our strongholds are often because of our own pride and arrogance. Super convicting. He said that it's because we live in this pride and arrogance that we will not submit we will not be obedient to what God says, and therefore we remain in bondage. And our greed is one of those things that leads us to all kinds of bondage. We desire for more, and this desire turns into jealousy, and jealousy turns into an attitude of ingratitude or discontentment. We don't believe that God is good. He hasn't provided for us in a fair way, because why do they all get that? We don't believe that he will provide and meet all of our needs. And so, because it's not fair, because we're jealous and greedy, we complain. We complain. And there's a lot of complaining that happens amongst the church. It, we are supposed to, as Christians, be a signpost to the nations. They ought to see our unity, our love, Christ in and through us. And too often, we look just like the rebellious, broken world we live in. We can take offense. I'm an expert at this. I could take offense just by the way you're sitting and listening to me right now. We can take offense and then we hold on to the offense. And after a while, we start to love the offense and let it divide you and I together. And we do this in all relationships, not just the church family, but we actually do this and it divides us from our creator, from our heavenly father. Maybe you're a complainer like me. You can easily, quickly complain about something. Well, I found over uh, some seasons of hardship, true hardship, that my complaints to my wife don't really build her up. My complaints to my friends usually have them going, yeah, you're right, they're wrong. That leaves me helpless and hopeless. But I've found that if I complain to the Lord, an all-powerful, almighty, loving God who sent his son to die for me, my complaints quickly turn to praise and worship. Can I encourage you? Bring your complaints to God. Bring them to God. It's good. You're upset. You're hurt. Bring it to God and allow him to speak into that. As a church family, we want to make sure that we honor God with our physical bodies, that we stand firm on the rock that is Christ, and that we do not let ourselves go back to slavery, to our old ways, our sinful flesh desires. As a church family, we want to make sure that we are united in Christ and that we don't allow the enemy to gain a stronghold or a foothold in our relationships with one another, in our marriages, lest our kids suffer, and in our friendships. And as a church family, we want to make sure that we have eyes fixed on our author, our perfecter, that we run the race well in throwing off those sin, the shackles that entangle us. And today we're going to observe communion together. And we're going to do this in light of the three testimonies that you're going to hear. You don't need to open it and wrestle with the cellophane yet. We'll all wrestle together in a second. <laughs> but today as we remember his sacrifice, his body broken for us, 
his blood shed for us. Today, as we do that, we proclaim, as Christians have for thousands of years, his death, his resurrection, the grace and the mercy of our Savior. And we do that so that we might live free. When Jesus was crucified, painfully beaten, and whipped for you and for me, when he was crucified, his side pierced, his hands, his feet pierced for you and for me, when he bore our sin, to declare us righteous. In the middle of all of that, our Savior was spit on and mocked by the very people he came to save. And we mock him as well. We mock him by thinking we don't need him. We've, we're in control, we got it. We mock him by thinking he's not a good provider. Why, why would he let that happen to those people and not to me? We mock him by putting him on a shelf for six days a week until Sunday, if we go to church on Sunday. We call it cheap grace when we abuse the grace of our God. And we mock the sacrifice of the cross, the forgiving, saving grace of Jesus. But today, we can repent of that. We can turn our face to Jesus. We can say in the name of Jesus, the spirit of us, the abuse that we've allowed to our bodies, the division we've allowed in relationships, the division that we've allowed between us and God, we can repent and find freedom in that today. Galatians 5 says it is for freedom, your freedom, that he died to set you free. So, Christ follower, if you're a Christian today, if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, stand firm. Stand firm on the rock and do not let yourselves be burdened again by the yoke of slavery. If you're not a, a, a Christian Christ follower yet, you haven't accepted him as your Lord and Savior, you could do that today. If you're not ready for that, feel free to just give this a pass and just spend some time in quiet reflection. As you'll hear in the testimonies, God is seeking you out and he would love to speak to you if you'd listen. As a church family, we're gonna bow for a word of prayer. We're gonna take a moment to just listen and then we'll wrestle with the cell. Then we'll partake of the body all at once together to symbolize the unity that we will not allow the enemy to gain a foothold in his church, his body. And then we'll share of the cup, his blood, the juice that is poured out for each of us. Let's bow for a word of prayer and we'll take a time of reflection. Dear Heavenly Father, we renounce all the uses of our bodies as instruments of unrighteousness. Father, we choose to present our physical body to you as an instrument of righteousness, your hands, your feet for your kingdom work. We present our physical body as a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to you. That we choose to reject the devil's lie that our body is any, in any way unclean or unacceptable to you. God, enable us to learn from our mistakes and guide us so that we don't repeat the same old patterns of the flesh. Father, we want to cast all our worries, all our burdens, all our anxieties on you, instead of trying to seek peace in any other place, in any other person, in any other substance. Lord, thank you for cleansing and forgiving us and accepting each one of us the way we are. Amen. Feel free to take a second and listen. Thank you, Jesus, for your body broken for us that we might have an eternal hope. You may now partake.
Thank you, Father, that you counted us worth it. That you would forgive us. And that you would allow your son's shed blood to be bestowed righteousness on each of us that we may have an eternal hope. We may partake. Well, Father God, hear your church, hear our cry, hear our repentant hearts. God, we thank you for the forgiveness, the patience, the mercy, and the undeserved grace that is you and that is your son, Jesus. And we invite you now, Holy Spirit, to come, to comfort us, to convict us individually, as families, as a church, that we might grow in maturity as believers and that we might find freedom in obedience to you. We thank you that we get to celebrate sons and daughters coming home, that you are at work amongst this community, that others are finding freedom in you because you, Holy Spirit, have not given up on us, but you continue to use us. We celebrate with all of heaven today as we baptize our brothers and sisters. Amen. Um, hi, my name is Rachel Dora. I was born and raised in a Christian home, and my parents sent me to a Christian elementary school. Uh, when I was young, I asked Jesus into my heart. Um, it was really easy to keep my faith when I was younger. I would read my Bible and pray really consistently. <laughs> so when my brother turned two years old, he was diagnosed with autism. At the time, I didn't really know what that meant, but um, as he got older, it put a lot of pressure and stress on my family, and we slowly stopped going to church. One of the hardest parts about the whole process and the situation was how it affected my parents. Um, and I kind of felt like God threw this hurdle into my family that was going to tear us apart. So when I was nine, um, I started to really hate the way that God made me, and I felt like he made a huge mistake when he made me, and I would never feel like I belonged anywhere. Um, when I got to high school, I was at my all-time low in my faith and my self-esteem, my self-image. Um, I started to seek control in other aspects of my life. I was convinced I was this awful person and that the world would be a better place if I wasn't in it. Around Christmas time of grade 10, I was referred to a specialist and I got in within a few weeks when the average patient would get in for, wouldn't get in for a few months, which is a big miracle in itself. And I was quickly diagnosed with an eating disorder. The outpatient treatment I was in allowed me to continue the school year and build relationships with my Christian friends that I had at the time. Uh, when I found myself getting that unhappy again, the minute school was done, I rushed back to Bible study and I went consistently throughout this entire past summer. And I think that was probably the happiest I had ever been. Like I found this joy I had never felt before. But in the past, I tried to fill the God-sized hole in my life with controlling food and exercise and getting the best grades I possibly can. But now I want to devote myself to living for Him and loving Him and serving Him rather than earthly things that aren't gonna last forever. I first came to New Hope six years ago now, um, after a lot of classmates were talking about it. My youth leaders, Karen and Jules, they like really made me feel welcome and included even though I wasn't feeling the best. Since I've welcomed Christ into my life, I've felt a lot more peace. Um, things that would have stressed me out in the past don't anymore. I don't spend a lot of time dwelling on things that I used to. It's freed up a lot of more space in my mind and helps me give this almost contagious happiness to the people around me. Baptism is a public declaration of my faith and it kind of feels like I'm being born into my faith rather than just having a belief. It means that I'm making my faith my own rather than just something that I was raised with and something my friends do. It's something that I want to pursue. My name is Rachel Dora and I can't wait to get dunked. <laughs> Rachel is joined in the tank by her youth leaders, Kara and Jules. And as she, in just a moment, is going to declare her faith in Jesus and be baptized into his name, she's also being baptized into becoming part of his body. And we, as Pastor Nathan talked about our one body, she's going to become our sister. And so I want to ask you, her brothers and sisters, are you ready to stand here and be and support her in the community of faith that she needs? Yeah? yeah? All right. It's cool because we can hear the place of that community of faith in her story, and you're going to hear it in the next two baptisms as well. And we're going to continue as a church to provide you with life group leaders and a community to study the Bible with, to spur you on, and to keep speaking the truth when the lies get loud. 
Are you ready to do that, church? All right. So we want to ask you, Rachel, do you believe that Jesus Christ is God's one and only son? Yes. Do you believe that his death, his burial, his resurrection, and ascension have the power to save you and grant you eternal life? Yes. And do you believe that it's enough? That he is enough? And are you ready to make him Lord, the boss of your life, for the rest of your life? Yes, I am. That on this, the confession of your faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Hi, my name is Katrina. Um, everyone calls me Kat. Um, I have a wonderful husband, Mike, and two beautiful twins, Dax and Quinlan. I was raised in a beautiful home with two wonderful parents who were always there for me. Um, my mom always brought us to church every Sunday um, and Wednesday night for kids' church events. When I was probably eight or nine, I uh, got to go to Big Lake Camp, which was a wonderful Christmas, uh, Christian camp in Nova Scotia. And I remember making a promise to Jesus there and then moving away to university. And I, I did try to go a little bit and it just, it didn't stick. That first Corinthians verse says um, not to be misled by bad company. I was like, I, I was the bad company. Drinking to excess and encouraging others to drink to excess was very fortunate to meet my husband while living in Toronto. He knew that I had faith, but he knew that I wasn't doing anything about it. Having kids, I did bring up that I would like to take them to church, but also didn't do anything about it. Um, and it wasn't until my husband got sick and he started walking every morning. And one day he came back and said, you know, I've been talking to God. I just felt like it was a call for me to stand up and say, yeah, yeah, I, uh, hear, it. I hear it too, so let's find a church. Coming to New Hope for the first time and uh, seeing so many people coming and going in between services and going into the sanctuary, um, you'd think you'd feel overwhelmed or like there's no community, but it, it was the opposite. It's a beautiful thing. I felt my kids were safe. And then even that, the first service, I'm like, okay, are they talking directly to just the two of us? <laughs> so we were, uh, we were hooked. I've never questioned any part of my faith before. So being in a room where that's possible is, uh, was pretty exciting for me. So I really enjoyed Alpha. I'm choosing to be baptized because um, it would be irresponsible at this point for me to not do anything about this faith that I have. Um, Jesus has been walking with me my entire life and I need him to know that. I know that. <laughs> Jesus being my Lord means that I am, I want to be more open uh, and let people know <laughs> why I am the way I am. My name's Katrina and I know that Jesus has been walking with me and I am ready to live my life and walk beside him. Amen. Well, Kat's joined in the tank with uh, husband Mike and lots of tears uh, of gratitude, <laughs> of gratitude. Uh, it's been a privilege of journeying with them, but isn't it crazy that somehow the chaos doesn't, they felt like they belonged? In the middle of the fourth service rush, a 15-minute turnover, this was their safe place. That's what the Holy Spirit does through and in you, church, as you make this a safe place for people to know, love, and serve Jesus. And that's why, as Pastor Sarah said, these guys are sharing their testimonies so that they might be known and loved. What a gift and a privilege to be the body of Christ, isn't it? Kat, you said you knew that he was with you the whole time, but you're now going to walk in step with him. So I'll ask you, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Yes. And do you believe that his death, burial, and resurrection has the power to forgive you of your sins and grant you eternal life? Yes, I do. 
And this is it. There's no little bumps anymore of wandering away, not from church, from God, most importantly. That you're going to be sold out following Jesus from here on out. He's Lord over all of it? All of, uh, over all of it. Over all of it. Amen. <laughs> and we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. My name is Mike Langley, and uh, I grew up in Niagara Falls, normal stuff with my family, my brother, my parents, but it was also tough because there was a lot of tension in the family. Um, grow up, we didn't, when I was young, we didn't attend a church. Um, it seemed like we were just kind of clawing our way through everything, and then things fell apart really bad when I was about 11, and my parents uh, split up and ended up divorcing, and there was a lot of relocating and a lot of family turmoil. After a little bit, my dad started going to church, and um, I started going to the youth group there, and I met a lot of friends there. It was, it was uh, comforting, and I spent a lot of time, actually. It was church on Sundays, and it was youth group on Wednesdays, and it was events on weekends, but all the time in between, I was doing really, really bad stuff, and uh, it didn't last long, and by the time I was about 16, I, I was out of the house on my own with my own apartment and I wasn't going to school and I was working full time and even subsidizing that with some illegal activity and that turned into, I realized that I was chasing things and I was looking for something. In my early 30s, I was living in Toronto and uh, that's where I met my wife Katrina. Um, we ended up moving to, to Niagara and we started our own business and we ended up getting married and had two wonderful children. But the lifestyle seemed to just get worse and worse. Um, the alcohol consumption got more and more. It was like I got better at it in, in a weird way and I started to feel terrible about everything and everything became hard. Waking up was hard and work was hard and my relationship was hard and my kids were hard and everything was a struggle. And then I got sick, really sick. And it was really bad. So I had a choice to make. I could uh, continue and that would uh, probably kill me or if not leave me pretty disabled or I could make some changes and uh, create a new life. So I chose that. After a while I really felt like I needed to buy a Bible so I did and I started reading it and I could feel things being revealed to me and I could start to understand things differently and I looked at things differently. I felt prompted to reach out to a youth leader from when I was 14 in the youth group. Um, so I did, I reached out to him on social media and, and we ended up going for coffee and I told him that I was making changes and that I was looking for a church that I could go to with my family and kind of start over. And he told me about New Hope Church, invited us to go. So we, we went to the first service and it was awkward and, and different and beautiful at the same time. And then the second time I was overwhelmed and that continued. And everything that I was reading was coming together in, in my mind and in my heart and the music. And it just seemed like Jesus was kind of telling me who he was. And I couldn't believe how real everything was. I don't want my uh, kids to have to wait until they're old and sick to get to know God. So I want to put him in the center of our family and my life and my business. My name's Mike and I'm not a fan of taglines, but I'm excited to leave everything behind me. I think you've discovered the only good use for social media, yeah. <laughs> which is reaching out to your youth leader from 14 years ago. So he's joined Mark, his youth leader, and uh, brother, it's been, it's been a journey. I love how on your walks with God, you just started talking to him. Maybe you haven't begun praying. Just go for a walk and talk to God. And he was chasing after you. He responded to you, and then you sought him in the scriptures, and now we get to journey life and faith with you. What a privilege and what a gift. 
because you chose to turn your life around. And so, Mike, you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Absolutely. And you believe that his death, burial, and resurrection has the power to forgive you of your sins and grant you eternal life. Yes. And he's Lord over every moment from here on out. He is in charge of your life. Yes. And on this confession of your faith, we baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, uh, we ought to celebrate, church. We ought to celebrate, and uh, I, I preached and said that uh, we build our life on the rock, the firm foundation that is Jesus, so the band just spontaneously came up with that song, uh, but we're going to sing that, that he is our firm foundation. Would you come forward and surround these guys, and let's sing that together as a church and declare that. Christ is my firm foundation, the rock on which I stand. When everything around me is shaken, I've never been more glad that I put my faith in Jesus, because he's never let me down. He's faithful through generations. So why would he fail now? He won't. He won't. And I've still got joy in chaos. Sing this. I've got peace that makes no sense. So I won't be going under I'm not held by my own strength Cause I built my life on Jesus He's never let me down He's faithful in every season So Thank you that we know you will never leave or forsake us. You've never failed us and never will. No matter what we're going through, you're always there with us in the storms. Thank you that we can declare that together this morning as we sing. And rain came 
even when blue miles was built on you sing it out new hope i'm safe i Even if the rain comes rain, rain, rain. I am safe. I'm gonna make it through. For 2,000 years in an unbroken chain, people have been declaring that and building their lives on Christ like Rachel and Kat and Mike have done today. And for over 3,500 years, people have been singing and praising the name of Yahweh. And in our shifting, changing culture and world and in our own shifting and changing minds and hearts, maybe this morning, maybe hearing their stories, you know that you need to connect with this ancient of days, a firm foundation. We would love to help you connect with this ancient faith. And it's a lot easier for us to help you connect if we can connect with you by like having your phone number and stuff. So if you are new to New Hope, maybe this morning, this is a good first step for you to just let us know you're here. We'd love to reach out to you and let you know how we can maybe be a, a community of faith for you to journey with. And some of you, maybe your first step this morning, your next step is to give for the first time. There is an envelope in the seat back in front of you. You can put that, the connect card, in the boxes to the sides or at the back. One of the reasons that Christians give is what Pastor Nathan talked about this morning, to break the bonds and the chains of greed and covetousness by saying, no, my faith is going to be in Jesus, not my ability to earn and spend and so you are welcome to participate with us in that this morning. As we head out to the tent, I'm going to pray in just a moment. You can buy your tickets for you and for your friends who don't know the love of Jesus, for your fave five, to NatFest. It's an amazing Christmas show. This, the gospel is going to be sung and heard, and it's all week long. So invite your fave five. Be brave. This is the week to actually ask your friends. I invited two of my fave fives yesterday. One had never been before, so I sent her the video from last year of NatFest to give her a taste of what it was like. And in the service, listening to uh, Rachel's testimony last service, God brought to mind another fave five that I need to use her testimony actually to invite to NatFest. And so I'm excited to do that. I don't know who you need to invite this week, but be brave and do it. 
And as you head out through the tent, you can also pick up your kids out there. You may have noticed that last week we were building an extra tent to have more space in that lobby. And unfortunately, we are no longer allowed to do that. Uh, we were ordered to stop work on that. You're going to hear in the coming weeks more information about how the OLT trial went, and especially as we know more. But it is clear that we are being opposed. There are forces against us. We have an enemy, and it's not people. People are never our enemy. We fight for people, not against them. But we have an enemy, and your leaders are feeling the burden of that. Mostly, we're feeling the burden that we know there are so many friends that we have, that you have, that need to know this freedom in Christ. And there's not a chair for them. We need to make more space. You can help with this. Right now, you can help with this. You can shift your family. Consider shifting your family to attending the 8 a.m. service where we still have some more room to make room in these later services for people new to Jesus. And you can pray and ask God as some of us have been, what he would have us do in the new year. Maybe you need to ask him whether you and your family should go to New Hope West. Some people have been asking us, what do we need? We're, we're not hearing clearly from God. We don't know what we need. Now we know what we need. The need is for more people to go to New Hope West and make room here for people from St. Catharines who don't know the freedom in Christ that is offered to them. If you haven't told us where you're planning to go in the new year uh, regularly on a Sunday morning, would you get a commitment card and let us know? They're available at all the stations by the offering box. You can pick that up. Let's pray and let's go out and enjoy each other in the tent and praise the Lord for the wonderful weather he's given us. So today we have a wonderful large lobby to enjoy together. Let's pray. Yahweh, we love you. We want to live our lives based on you, Jesus, on the firm foundation that you are. We know that we have been bought at a price. We thank you that you have paid the price for Rachel and Mike and Katrina. And we pray that they would remember that for the rest of their lives and that we would remember that you have paid the price for us. We are not our own. And so would you empower us, Holy Spirit, to go out and live like that. Live in the freedom for which you have set us free. We pray this in your name. Amen. Enjoy each other in the tent. And if you're able to stack chairs, we need all of them gone. All the chairs are going to be stacked. Stacks of five. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm.